ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of the Women's Show. I'll be your host, Trisha Gloria Navae. Um, today or tomorrow, we'll be celebrating the International Human Rights Day as Uganda. And our theme is Back to Equality for All and Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But before that, the whole of last week was, you know, an entity around human rights. We call it the Human Rights Week. And so today we sit down to have a conversation around, you know, what that, what that means for Ugandans, but also for women in particular and girls. We had the Anti-Corruption Day commemorated as well. And for the better part, it looked like we had a little bit of gains. It's up for question, especially for me. So today we sit down to talk about corruption and the stakes it has for women and also the human rights condition and maybe also the violations when it comes to women and girls. And to help me have this conversation, I have two ladies who will introduce themselves and we dive into the conversation. Welcome, ladies. Thank you very Thank much, you. Gloria. Hi, everyone. My name is Naima Isasebi, I'm a feminist lawyer, and I'm happy to be back. Thank you for always coming. My pleasure is all mine. Mm. Hi, everyone. I'm Winfred Mugambwa. I'm a queer citizen of Uganda, and I work with Rights for Uganda. Thank Welcome you, Kostin. Thank and, you. And maybe also to begin from that point, I want us to talk about corruption later, but, you know, in the bigger picture of human rights, you know, what's the image when it comes to human rights and women? You know, what, what's the everyday condition in Uganda as regards to either protecting the rights of women or even, um, I think, their violation as well. Because it's hard to talk about one and not, you know, dive into the other. Yeah, so just give us a synopsis of what that looks like. Um, first, I'll, 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 I'll celebrate the milestones so far achieved. Um, but as you mentioned, the equality for all, the theme, that all beats my understanding when it comes to human rights. Because... Um, because uh, different women face violations differently. Mm -hmm. We all, we all, we are all uniquely differently created. Mm -hmm. And uh, Uganda is a diverse community. It's a diverse country. Different women. We have disabled women. We have women like me who are queer. Mm -hmm. We have um, heterosexual women. We have different women. So when we are talking about human rights and we are talking about equality for all, what do we really even mean? Mm. In the all, what do we really mean? Um, in Uganda, there is a way we have, um, I think, rights have been, uh, have been, uh, been uh, designed in a way like this are supposed to be women's rights, mm. yes? When we talk about education and we're like, we have, women have to have access to education. We look at it in the perspective, in the narrative of who a woman, how Uganda defines, um, how the laws of Uganda define a woman. And very many women and girls uh, end up not getting that, uh, the, uh, getting education because of that. When we talk about rights to access to health, are we really being uh, like inclusive enough? Are all women accessing health? Are all women accessing health in their diversity? Mm -hmm. Yes. That is where we need to redefine what really rights in Uganda are. Are we really meeting, yes? The equality for the all. The equality for all. Mm -hmm. Are we being inclusive? Are all women accessing rights? Are we even promoting uh, security mm -hmm. and protection for all women? Not promote, we don't have to promote, uh, to promote um, either heterosexual or, mm -hmm. uh, or uh, uh, other rights, but mm -hmm. are we promoting security are we promoting the right access uh, access to, to to services uh, for all so to me i feel as much as we have achieved we have moved a milestone there's a lot lacking yes. and every and when we say all it is just a bracket. We are trying to run away from the reality by bracketing, using such words as equality for all. Mm. And then we define like celebrations are taken in Guru. Let me give an example. But the delegation will come from Kampala sure. to Guru. And what will be heard will be that which is done in research. And as they are doing research, who do they reach out to? So there's a lot of a lot of work to be yet done. And I hear you because when you say all, 
it speaks to what we usually say here the, on, on the show, the, the beauty of intersectioning. Mm. The, can we now break down what all means? Yeah, what is and then we the say, all? When we say all, we are saying Naima's favorite tagline, the refugee women. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when we are saying all, we are meaning also women that are not usually mainstream, yeah. out of the normative. So I hear you about intersectioning, our equality for all. Can we break down, you know, that Yeah, we need to unpack find, it. Unpack it and yeah. say, so this is what we mean. We mean persons with disabilities. Mm. We mean, you know, the sex workers. We mean, you know, the queer women. Women who use drugs. Women, yes. Women, lesbian, bisexual, queer women. We need to unpack it because we are confusing. We confuse ourselves. First, we confuse ourselves. Yes. Unknowingly thinking that we are not confusing ourselves. We are also confusing that the other people we are trying to do what mm -hmm. to represent i can i can uh, go to a, a wrong audience thinking that since it is equality for all i am also supposed to be there you get yeah. so we need to unpack that all uh, and maybe then to bring my mind into this conversation a lot of our organizing in the past as the women's movement was collective action and collective effort mm -hmm. especially in regards to human rights violations but uh, fast forward, and I do not want to imagine that this was a precedent of the public order management bill, but it also, you know, played a role in how we organize differently. Mm. And today now we have the Computer Misuse Act. How can we protect, you know, freedom of expression and assembly, especially for women in regards to advocating for our rights? Uh, well, to me, it's sad that... Uh even when we talk about women's rights, there are people who will bring very obnoxious questions like, are they, are women animals? Who believes women are animals? <laughs> they are humans and we believe that. And we forget the bigger picture mm. is, we talk about human rights. Mm. And most of the people whose rights are violated are women. Yeah. And if their rights are being violated as women specifically, that means they're not being considered human yeah. at a certain yeah. point. Um, I'm going to give a case in point. If we look at uh, the previous incidents that has been happening in Gulu, the bylaw that was passed where yes. women are supposed to sit at the front, because yes, the presumably the they are yeah. the causes of, of accidents. accidents. And I'm like, okay, sincerely speaking, if we are to do statistics mm -hmm. on how these accidents have been caused, you will not find a woman in, in, in the space. Mm -hmm. But because community believes in blaming women for their own faults. So this is when they're like, yeah, we can abuse these rights and blame it on women mm. so we can justify our wrongdoings, which is not, that's violating women's rights. Yeah. Then what happens to women who literally drive? So if you're being distracted by a woman, because I'm not saying that's, that's the case. If you're being distracted by a woman, you are the problem. Mm. They should revoke, revoke your driving, driving habit, license, which means you cannot concentrate on what the driving is all about. If you're going to be all over the place when driving, yet driving needs someone who's sober, you know, and imagine, attention. because I know for a fact, I don't think blue women came or what. And, and it has also reminded me of, of the amazing. campaign that just ended of what, was I, what, what I was wearing. <laughs> And the idea was that violence against women is not is never really about even what they are wearing. Like I always say, it's also one of my favorite taglines. Women in India wouldn't have been, you know, facing rape and defilement mm. and all that because their dress code is very modest. Exactly. Women in Iran, in, in Saudi Arabia, in Iraq, in Qatar wouldn't be undergoing, you know, violence, rape and, and all those sexual harassments because they're very modest. Mm. But surprisingly, you find that the statistics say otherwise, like they're being, you know, harassed, their rights are being violated. Uh, it's not about how you dress. It is the person that thinks it's how you dress that provokes them. Mm -hmm. I always ask men, are you animals that you do not have uh, self-control, you know, that what you see, it's like an invitation to treat. Yeah. As a human being that's different from an animal, you should be able to have control. And you're like, you know what? If she dressed like that, it's her choice. I should not violate her rights because of how she's dressed. If that was the case, honey, men dress up and we're seeing their undergarments in the outside. So if it was, let's change the narrative. Let's start harassing them for their dressing and then we'll see if the stakes will be the same. So what I'm saying with now with the collective organizing as women organization, organizations and the women movement. The bylaw that was passed in Gulu should not have been passed mm. 
And what True. if it's the driver trying to harass the person? You know, and that, she's trying to defend herself <laughs> so that the accident, accident mm. occurred. Mm. Mm. We should focus, like Winnie said, on which women are we talking about? Are we talking about the women in the urban center? I'm not saying that the women in the urban centers are protected and know their rights. You'll be shocked yeah. at how much many of them do not know what their rights are. True. Um, so we need, I think, to do better as a country. I always say civic engagement, civic education is important in the syllabus, syllabus of education. Mm. The government needs to rethink. I know they are revamping the syllabus and all the education system. Yeah, we used to have we, civics. Yeah, we should have civic mm. education. A child in P1 should be in position to say, do not touch me without my yes, consent. Yes. That is her protecting her rights, her personal space. A child in P5 should be able to say, Sex. Keep your hands to yourself. Keep your hands to yourself. Mm. Do not touch me. This touch is not allowed. You're violating my personal space. Mm. If our children cannot do that, as a mm. government, we are failing the future leaders or the future of the country. Mm -hmm. So we need to, in as much as we're saying equality for all, what equality are we really talking about? And this also speaks to when religious leaders during the COVID-19 and the children going back yes. to school who were pregnant, saying that it is uncouth for a pregnant child to be taken back to school. Whose rights are you violating to education here? It's the girl child's religion, education. The, also the religious, and the religious entity itself is quite problematic because in that very narrative as well, yes. there was that take of, now we need to check for virgin girls and give them money. That is invading their personal space. That is already yeah. violence. Yes. Yeah, that's violence. Yes. So, um, and honestly, me, I don't know more about the other religion, but my religion speaks to protection and protection and preventing of violence against women. Mm -hmm. So you as a religious leader can rightfully stand and defend the rights violators of children mm -hmm. and say, now let's victimize those that are victims. Re-victimization of them is not right. Mm -hmm. As a government, you need to put up, we need to put up our, you know, our stand on what the rights to a girl, child and women are. I'm also speaking to the fact that, you know, when there's a, that bill of the indecence, indecence and what? Yes. When women were being undressed in the streets mm, of Kampala, yeah. mm. downtown, and being beaten for dressing the way they dressed. The mini skirt look. Where <laughs> was the <laughs> government mm. to say, you know what? It does not mean that you should violate the woman's rights. Yeah, yeah. If she dressed like that, then probably we should inquire as to, and decency, what's the definition of decency? Mm. It's subjective to individuals. That's to Muslims, I might be to do with it. Well, I think culture, culture is who we are. And it's sad that the protectors and prevent and protectors and the diehards of culture are the same people protecting patriarchy and defending it seriously. So I believe culture can be changed because I, Winfred, and you are culture. Mm -hmm. We are from the you know, different cultures. But who protects and you know makes the culture keep moving? It's me as an individual. We mm. need to be open-minded and rethink whether these values and these cultures that we so want to protect are contravening the provisions of our constitution and the declaration of human rights. Human rights, are, if you want to grow as a community, you cannot ignore human rights. Yeah. And if you're still going to uphold cultures that are violating rights of women, then that's not culture we should be depending on. We should look at culture that protects women, mm -hmm. culture that upholds women, and cultures that think women are important, yeah. women are key in the community, and hence they need to be protected like any other person in the community. And let me bring you in, Winnie. When we talk poverty, pandemics, and police violence, it is very important for us to address you know, the pervasive, you know, detachment of security officers to protecting the rights of women, especially, and I'll give an example, because a pandemic put that spotlight, and we had been having this conversation post, pre-pandemic, -pre on, you know, we police protect the women. I mean, the Women's March of 2018, mm. that was a tagline, police protect the women. And fast forward, we have L LDUs, beating mm. women, pregnant women, violating them during at, at the height of a pandemic. How do we, an entity that's supposed to have law and order or protect the people, how do we have the police, you know, value the lives of women in, in Uganda? Um, we still have to do a lot of empowerment. When you talk about empowerment, 
I think they saw it differently, understand it. I don't know how the government understands empowering um, people like the police. You could go somewhere and the police don't know, some people don't know even about the rights. Mm. Yes? Yeah. Maybe when they, were, they are being trained, they are taught about rights. Mm. But remember, we are different individuals. Yeah. How often, I'll give examples, there are very many organizations that have done very many, like, sensitization with police around women's rights. Mm. It, but remember, after a few moments or a few months, uh, these officers are transferred to another place. Then a new person comes in. Yeah who either pretend, because when you ask them, they tell you, for us, they train, the, they train us when we are, we are still at the, their school, they train them about human rights. Mm -hmm. But again, the person they will change, uh, um, will again pretend, I'll call it pretend because they say they are mm -hmm. trained. That's or they are not true. trained. And or they are, even, <laughs> and even when you say that, because mm -hmm. when you say pretend, even in reporting women cases, mm -hmm. it's very possible that you drug. I think I, in this week I, I saw a case of a woman who went to report a domestic violence case and um, what is it called? Abandonment. And then she gave birth at the police station. Mm -hmm. But I'm imagining if they had expedited this because you first, you know, have this first care of is this person actually in the right state of mind to be here in this moment? What psychosocial or extra support can we give in this moment before most probably she sat through it. She sat through that time and she had her baby at the police station. Yeah. Before, I, before even I talk about the police at the lower level, I'll start from the judges. Let me give you a scenario of uh, cases of rape. You see how those cases are handled in the court. How a victim or a survivor is expected to express themselves, to express the action, what really happened to them. Yes? And that is where most of the people fail. Because it is not even easy. Because of someone is of the survivor's mental like status by then. And these judges are who are in these spaces, who are in these uh, positions, can't even see anything wrong with yeah. how they are yeah. trying to exercise their duties, how they are trying to run the case. They don't see anything wrong with that. And then you go down to the police, who are, who are the first people we go to, to, and we are telling them you're supposed to protect women, yet they are the very ones are violating the what? Our rights. Police, let me give an example. When a policeman comes to the scene, First we come from first we have grown up in an environment which has corrupt our minds. Mm. Many people many, many men's mind are corrupt that women are property to men. A woman is um and so you report the message you say, what did you do? What did you do? Yes, okay. not even what did you do, but but you know they want now to to try to shift shift the blame to the survivor or the victim, yes? Mm -hmm. But that comes from the, um, from, a, from, from the cultures we are coming from, what they taught us, what religion taught us, what, uh, so our minds are corrupt from childhood. Mm -hmm. And where the problem goes is now where we grew up from, yes? The laws, some of the laws, mm -hmm. the schools we go to, some of the teachers. Oh, so yeah, we come. Yes, we come from childhood being corrupt, our minds being corrupt, and our mind does a lot of work on someone's mm -hmm. uh, well-being, someone is thinking, mm -hmm. someone is decision making, mm -hmm. and when you get a policeman who has not been sensitized enough, who has not been empowered enough, mm -hmm. and that is the majority in the police force, mm -hmm. you and you expect them to protect women. Yes, you talked about poverty. Poverty is, is violence itself. And that is why, to me, I believe, that is why they want to keep women in poverty. Yes? And someone said poverty has a female face. You talk about the last <laughs> mile. When you talk about last mile poverty, there is yeah. a face of a woman. Sure. I, that picture. Yes, because they are keeping us there so that they can easily violate women. That is why they keep women so much in at the, Well, I, I just to build on on, yeah. um, on Winnie's statement, like I said earlier, the police, like you said, they say they're trained. Mm -hmm. Yes. The, mi the amount of training they take to understand issues of human rights is you leave them, you breathe, the, you breathe them, you're born with those rights. 
So if we are not having civic education mm -hmm. for someone to know, because like mm -hmm. you said, the community uh, brainwashes us. You know, for example, there are cultures I know and say if a man does not beat you, it doesn't mean it shows that he doesn't love you enough. Mm -hmm. And and so those things is because we've let culture take over. Uh, the secular setting of a nation, the centralized laws that we have as a nation. And also the same reflects in the laws that are being passed. Uh, these parliamentarians and the lawmakers... They always consult. They, are from they consult, but you see, like, many of the laws we have are masculine. Yes. And they are not uh, gender yes, sensitive I mean, at not, all. Yes. If they were, we wouldn't be having these amendments yes. every day and night, you know. So... The fact that we do not have the civic engagement as watching as social media. Just remember some social years. harassment. Yes. Yeah. And then this father was training that son saying, my fist is not to hit women. I, Telling I the son, that. it yes. is to protect Prote women yes. in my life. Yes. If we had a community that trains boys and men, that when you put a fist, it's not to harm a woman, but to protect the yeah. woman. And that's what our religion, that we so claim we are mm. so, you know, religious. Mm. Our religions, let it be Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, or mm. any other religion mm. someone believes, it preaches protection of women. Mm -hmm. So it beats my understanding to see, uh, you know, be it being done otherwise. And us saying that, you know, me as first a Muganda or a Msoga mm. or a Mankole before, you know, I was a Muslim or before I was, I'm a Ugandan. Yes, love your culture, but for as much as how much is it protecting, you know, the people in your community. Yeah. I remember during the elections, there was a lady who was refused by the family of her husband to use the family name in the posters. You know, that is violating her rights to participate in the politics yes, and yes, the civic yes, space yes, of the country. Okay. So... What are we doing in trying to, I'm going, for the lack of a better word, put in the heads of people, impact knowledge for them to know that rights are fundamental from the time you are born? And, and, and I like, think when you say that, you know, know, before you come so, in, Winfrey, yes. um, a lot of these conversations stem in, in our understanding that patriarchal systems had to break because they constantly evolve True. and create pushback. And so, whereas that question is there, it may be rhetoric in nature because we keep pushing back against the pushback. Yeah. I think that is one of the taglines of the 16 days of gender. It's like against the pushback, we push back. Because it almost feels like we go two steps forward in our advocacy and in our, you know, our, mm. our ability to challenge the, the status quo only to be retracted. Yeah. Or sure. for the violence to evolve as well. So how do we... And not just, especially for justice as well. Mm. How do we create pushback or hold this, you know, have litigation, hold these entities to account in making sure that they either expedite, you know, issues that deal mm. with women or create a semblance of, I don't know how to call it, systems that work for women. Okay, so um, I'll just say that First of all, I'd like to commend our judiciary system that is putting states yeah. in ensuring that cases of GBV are being held in special court mm -hmm. sessions mm -hmm. and they're trying to put into consideration issues to do with how then do we litigate like cases, cases of violence, rape, defilement, mm -hmm. to make sure that there's no uh, double victimization mm -hmm. and protecting of the victims. Mm -hmm. And I think there's so many organizations that have been working with the judiciary to ensure that it has been done and there's so yeah. many justices yeah. that have been doing it. Mm -hmm. But to mention, but a few those that I personally know that have done it, there is Lady Justice Nabi Sinde, mm -hmm. Lady Justice Eva Luswata, mm -hmm. Sister Batema, Lady mm -hmm. Just, Lady, um, the Justice Batema, he calls himself Sister Batema, so mm -hmm. pardon me for saying that. So the fact that they are there are steps being taken to ensure that, you know what, let's consider. There are special court sessions that have been going on on GBV. I think there was a, a pilot being done in Karamoja. Mm -hmm. And so the justice system is doing a lot to see. Um, and then recently, Action Aid has been partnering with the judiciary to ensure that there is a review of the gender-based violence handbook mm -hmm. to guide, you know, judges and the court system on how to handle these cases. So I think there are steps that are being done, which we have to, you know, commend them for it and acknowledge mm -hmm. uh, that they're doing a lot. But still, it goes back. Now, the adversary court uh, system that we have, you know, yeah. where you have to prompt, ask, prove what you allege... It stems from the law. That's why I'm saying that our laws are not gender sensitive. True. It stems from the law because the law says for evidence to be admitted, 
he who alleges must prove. prove. And there's no court that is going to, <laughs> you know, make a, a, a statement or pronounce itself on an issue that has not been proven True. otherwise. Mm. So you rather abort, you know, uh, mm. a case mm. for someone, an, an innocent person to be saved than crucify an innocent mm. person. Mm. So it stems back from our laws. If our lawmakers have some gender sensitivity, you know, and say, you know what, for these special cases, this should be, uh, the, the, you know, the laws of procedure, the, law, the courts would admit that and ensure that they follow as the law provides. So mm. I'll not, I think, blame the judiciary system I or the laws. Yeah. The courts are law because mm. they are guided but by the, the law. law. The land, and sure. the people who are responsible for these laws are the parliamentarians. And these are the people, I always say that our parliament sometimes is a joke because you find a farmer, comedian in the, in the, in parliament. the parliament. These are people who are passing laws without really even reading That's to understand they really what these laws are. Mm. And, that, yeah, and this they is affecting the Wagon. quality of the laws that we have in our country. And it also stems back to what civic education are people having, okay. even a farmer who has, mm -hmm. you know, a background on their civic yeah. duty mm -hmm. and, um, and on their rights, and their rights, mm -hmm. they would make better laws mm -hmm. because they have that background. With that, because our law says what P seven S four to for you to stand as a as a mm -hmm. If in those years they were trained on human rights, what their rights are as citizens of the country. Six. Yeah, they would even make better politicians mm -hmm. than someone who comes and has no background in anything whatsoever to do with rights and law to come and you know represent you in parliament. Mm -hmm. And then these laws that they pass, and it also stems back to corruption. How are these people being you know, appointed into yeah. office. Mm. Are they paying? What's the stake in passing these laws? In fact, what's the stake? Mm. Also, what's the stake in electing them as members of parliament? So it's something that is really deeply stemmed and rooted in from, you know, the community. If you're putting a representative to represent you in parliament, who is not fit to, you know, discuss and argue and break down to understand the law and the bill they're going to pass, then it's, it's as good as nothing. It doesn't make sense to have only five people who understand the laws that are being passing and the rest are like, say I, I, say I, nine, nine. nine. Okay. It okay. does not make sense. The so, politics of I and nine. Yes. The, the, the corruption that comes from even during the elections, during the nominations, how is the system being protected to ensure that we are passing the quality people yeah. who will pass the quality law that we need that will then protect women? If we do not look at that, then... And, and, just and be... because you're the lawyer on the on the show, permit me to ask you on this. Um, there was a precedent in court this 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 previous month. I think this month itself, no, last month, on property rights. Yes. Especially in 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 the in the sharing of property when marriage is being dissolved, mm. and the judges that passed the ruling, you know, gave the women. An, equation, an, an equivalent of the work the house the house managers do is what you will take with you and what you got in this marriage. If you didn't have a 50-50 stake in it, you don't take it. A lot of other people say because of the way, you know, the lives of women are structured, it's never going to be fair mm. to share property on that regard. How do we, especially in protecting women's, you know, rights within the marriages, post-marriage, and the access to property and all these things, how do we have better rulings as well? Because in as much as the law speaks, there are precedents that the courts of law also make that for a very long time will affect, you know, yeah. justice for women. How do we have, you know, better advocacy at that front so that regardless of whether the laws are in a way, that precedents like that can be dealt with? Okay, I think so. The question I, uh, that precedence has been, uh, I think, discussed. I think Law Society gave a detailed uh, surgery of that uh, that ruling. Personally, as a feminist, um, I don't think that was the best. Uh, it's the best precedence for you know women, and especially with the fact that we've been advocating so much on the unpaid care work yes. that women do, and. What was the scale that was used to determine, you know, that ruling? And I'm giving an example of, let me give an example of a woman who toils the farm, mm -hmm. you know, plants, let's say plants the seeds, harvests, and then the man comes in, you know, to sell the proceeds yeah. and take the money. Mm -hmm. And now the woman 
cannot afford to mm. pay mm. for the land and it's the man who has the money that yeah. pays the land. And the fact that even in contracts, most women sign as witnesses and not yes. co-owners of property. Mm. So even when it is her who has paid or bought you know, the property, she, she will appear it. as a witness, mm. not, uh, not as a co-owner. And this also stems back, like when you say, in the culture, we have been raised saying, that, being told, if you're a powerful woman, you will not make a good wife. So even if it's you who's doing this, credit should, be given, yeah, credit should mm. be given to you know, the man so that he's the man of the house. That alone is brainwashing the woman and even taking away from her rights, her rights to own property. So that precedence to me was not fair to, to women, especially women who are not as loud as us, who will be like, oh, yeah, what's yeah. mine? I'll mm. put a stamp on it mm. to show that's mine. Yeah. So there are women who do that. They might not be uneducated. They might be educated women, but at the back of the mind, society has made them believe they cannot own property as women mm. because it's intimidating mm. the man in their life. She's too powerful for the man. She might be left because she's too powerful. Mm. So there are women who think, I cannot own this. I should give credit to the man. Then at the dissolution of the marriage, this is when you see that effect of the decision that you made, of what society made you to believe. So what society is basically doing, it's shaping you, molding you to live in poverty. Mm. Because imagine if this woman was supervising the construction work, she was yes. feeding the people constructing. Can you monetize mm. the amount of time yeah. to ensure that whatever it's you as a man it's... has bought is being utilized the way it has to. So her contribution should not be and I'm, I'm wondering, what was the minimum wage that they used to compute what she would have done as a house manager? As a house manager. I, I'm wondering what that looks like. And do we even have a minimum wage as a country? It's a precedent to be, we need to challenge. Yes, it is a precedent that needs to be challenged. And I, for the women and the women's movement to really think through, get lawyers to really dig through and challenge and appeal the decision. And get judges who are really sensitive and agendered in, in the ruling and to make a decision that would really make precedence for women and protect them as women, not you know, to make them look like whatever we've worked for, like you say, five steps forward, three steps backwards. Back. Yeah. Thank you very much. And dignity, freedom, and justice for all. That is the tagline and the theme for this year's Human Rights Day. And maybe to bring also winning to this conversation, when we have this when you speak of freedom, when you speak of dignity, one thing that keeps popping up as we were having this conversation is that we've now come into a dispensation where we are more te technologically, you know, swavy, and not necessarily that all of us are swavy, but that we've, we are now in a dispensation where we are both living digital lives and also everyday lives. But also our everyday is intertwined with a digital world. But when it comes to freedom of expression, especially for women, there is a little bit of misogyny, not even a little, I think it's a lot of misogyny online and violence online that we cannot begin to deal with because we've barely understood the digital world as well. Mm. And when we speak to human rights and freedom and dignity, how do we you know, strike that balance in protecting women online? and also in dealing with the violence that comes with using these spaces. How do we do that? Um, I'll, I'll start from where um, Naima said when he talked about, when she talked about um, uh, religion protecting women. I'll mm. start from there. Uh, when we talk about religion protecting women, I feel it's just a face value, yes? Yet it's the same religion telling women to be submissive. Mm. Yes, you're telling someone, you're protecting someone, but you're forcing them to be submissive to everything. Like, you have to be submissive to a man. The and how people, Yes. I don't know how many times I've been online and they told me, decoram. And, 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 and submission mm. comes with a lot of violence. Mm. So we understand submission differently. Yeah. Yes. So, coming from there, and then also... Uh, talking about the quality of people we're having in parliament mm -hmm. and how they understand the law. 
I think if we go into, into quality of people, it might be hard for us as voters yeah. in Kamu, in Fabo, Muchalo, mm, Mutuwa once. Mm, it might be mm. hard for us to measure the quality because even some people come in suits, know the law, understand English. By the time you put them in, uh, in, in the parliament, you will see how much they can put rubbish on the table mm. because they are protecting their interests. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So measuring someone's quality in line with uh, how they are going to represent the people, it might be hard. But even the speed, the parliament these days takes on to pass laws one after the other as if they are on a marathon. I think that is where the problem I think is. My biggest challenge in Parliament is the A's and the nays <laughs> of making legislation. The speed. I is... was thinking about it and I was like, is it possible that at some point we can have legislators vote on a bill with a reason why? And why it's important yes, but to I... vote on such a bill so that we, we stop making you know laws out of the eyes have it. No, it's this parliament, I think it's just a bandwagon. Yes? You just look at the number. So everyone giving a reason, eh? Maybe it would be hard for the for the speaker. Yes. But I think even the and time when era, when when the and people the it is possible. Also, yeah. It is possible, but look at the, she talked about quality. Mm -hmm. Yes. I am also talking about reasons why people are in parliament. Most of them are protecting their own interests. Yes, we voted them and they clapped. Mm. Thank you, but we are going there for our own interests. Mm. Yes, when they're in parliament and, and they're passing the laws, we don't even know each one's contribution. Like you're saying, can people give reasons? Is it, is it even possible mm. in this corrupt parliament we have in Uganda? Yes, you see how, you see how they, paraded, they parade people. We have found this person corrupt, we have found this person corrupt, but people are staying in positions. Me, I even think they, they need to stop saying that we've gotten a corrupt official. Let's name them as thieves. Someone has stolen funds, they are thieves. They are not only corrupt, mm. let's add on the theft. Yes, going online, it might not be easy to protect someone online, yet we have failed to protect women offline. Yeah. It is going to be difficult for us. Yes. First of all, when the same look, people offline are the ones online. The same, not even the same people. Few people are online. Yes. Very many people are offline. True. Yes. Mm -hmm. We have failed to protect people offline from where we are coming from, and then we are rushing to online. Just even when you go to police and you're uh, reporting a case of being violated online, even the police, the people in authority who are supposed to help you, they'll even ask you, how, how, how can you be violated online? Even the implementers, even the people who are supposed to protect us don't know even how to protect us online. Mm -hmm. But it starts from, because they have even failed to protect women offline, they can't even jump on protecting women online. online. It goes back to the laws. And so no wonder we can make the, mis the, 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 the computer misuse law and have it there only to realize that it's also violating people's yeah. rights. It is. <laughs> when we go back, that is where I said interest. People are doing things out of their own interest. They, they are passing laws that serve their own interest. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was saying that uh, laws they consult, I didn't mean that they consult cons constituencies. Uh, most of the laws, um, they consult the cultures, mm -hmm. the religions in place, which already Violence, violating women's rights, yeah. women's rights, which are already, uh, they're, they're, they, 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 they come from the angle of patriarchy. Mm -hmm. Yes. So how do we expect to have better laws? Um, I, I want to recommend, uh, to appreciate and recommend this government. They have put me, women in very many positions. She has mentioned very many women in the judiciary, but I feel personally, I feel these women are seated on a hot seat. In too much power. They, have they are not uh, even, they are, yes, they have the power there, but they are not allowed to exercise their power. That is what I personally I feel, yes, that they are, yes, women are, women are talking about their rights. What can we do? I feel, personally, I feel men grow up 
with the art of manipulation. Sure. And they are good at manipulation. Yes? And um, as they are uh, giving women uh, positions in ministries, uh, they are giving women in a uh, uh, position in, the, on, in important uh, places, I feel these women are, are seated on a hot plate. The men behind them or the men above them are not giving them chance to fully, 100%, exercise their what? Their power, yes? And, and the other thing, when we go online, you will see when, when, when a woman is being violated online, and unless there is a campaign, very many women go unhelped online. Yeah. Like I told you, there are no laws that will protect them. Men have more time online, eh? <laughs> and men are very aggressive, eh? They are very aggressive, yes? Um, our cultures and religion teach us not to, like, speak a certain way. Mm. But men will get away with it, you know? Mm. They, they've, they've found they a way. Women they, have, and they have, they have, they have, well. they, they yeah. know they'll, they'll get to your body. They'll get to your body and start violating you. They'll use, they have ways of... Um, violating us verbally yes and most of the times women will withhold because culture has taught us to be humble you have to be humble you don't have to use certain words towards a man you have to you don't have to use certain words you know when a man comes and abuses you when a man few women will come out and speak about a man's body That's yes true. because they have That's they have so corrupt true. our mind yeah. that we don't have to speak about this we don't have to speak about um men having those big berries men having those so you know no wonder men and i was very glad that the men called out a fellow man who was in in the business of the vice president like leave that woman's body alone because the shock of the matter is, this is your vice president, and you've forgotten that element of power she holds, only to be concerned of whether she's going to have a child or not. It was very problematic, but I am glad that there were men that mm. called him out. Called him yeah. out of yes, crazy. there are men. There are men calling calling um, fellow men out, but at what percentage? Mm. At what percentage? Yes, and truth is, they called out that fellow man because they were talking to about that vice. They violated the vice president. But me, Winnie of Kamwenge, Winnie coming from my village, and they start violating me online. How many men will come out? Sometimes men come out. Many times men come out to defend women who have already status. And that is what I say. They've learned the art of manipulation. They'll see where will we gain. They'll come out. Yes? When they see they are not gaining anything, they'll stay quiet. Yes? And um, these days there is this thing of uh, engaging men. I like it so much. Bringing men in our spaces to fight violence. I mm, love it like so me. much. I'm, I'm coming. I'm coming where I'm saying I like it so much. I like it and I like it that it's we women pushing it so much. But when I ask myself, yes, as we bring these women, men on board, why don't they create those spaces? And we go bring them on board from their own spaces they've created, yes? Even online, like men, like campaigns, women have held campaigns to protect women online. Let men create that space and then men come up to speak about violence against women online. Why do we have to bring them on board on our spaces we've created? I was just, I wasn't, I wasn't yeah, meaning that I like it. The, the biggest pushback I have seen. I want the them to create the, the spaces. <laughs> that is why I first said they're manipulators. Mm. They've learned the art of manipulation. Yes. Mm. Now we are, we are saying that, yes, we need them. And I'm saying, yes, we need them on board. But we need them from their spaces. Yes. I want men to create a space just to speak about how they need to stop violating women. Maybe to ask you there, do you imagine that the men in their boys club will have time to discuss the men's issues? That is, if you're that. understanding me well, that is what I mean. That is why mm -hmm. they are saying, they are even using us women to say that, you people, we need men in our spaces to help us fight uh, violence against women, to help us empower women. And me, I'm like, yes, we need them, but we need them from their space. 
I, I get it. You. We need them to I do it you. from their I'm own space. And we come there and help them from there. We, we're going to take a break. But um, in the Human Rights Report of 2021, there was one key aspect that I want to celebrate when it comes to the women's movement in Uganda and dealing with online violence. In August 2021, there was a petition by, the, by human rights organizations, lawyers and activists, the Constitutional Court annulled the 2014 Anti-Pornography Act. Mm. And the act criminalized sharing nude photos. And in some instances, it was used to arrest women whose intimate photos were leaked online. And so the court disbanded, you know, the anti, the, the, the nine-member pornography control committee that was set up in 2017. And I think that is a good step in, it may not do the work, but it's a good step in protecting women, especially when, you know, intimate pictures are shared without consent. It's a beginning in an era where women's bodies have been used as, as a tool of violence. And, so, and to silence us. And to silence them. And so I want to thank the women's movement for, you know, joining together in collective action with activists and lawyers and in making sure that work can be done to protect women's dignity and freedom and also justice. Let's come back. Welcome back. Don't forget to click like and subscribe to the Civic Space TV. And we're coming back and as we want to wind on this conversation, we want to talk about corruption. The anti-corruption week also happened last week. And the minister gave a statement on how far we have, we've come in our fight against corruption. And the narrative was 26 high-profile cases were being investigated and some good money had been recovered. But also, in that conversation, there was a celebration that had way too much money to be spent in Iwanda district. And so today, when we speak about service delivery, women, and corruption, it is sad to note that, you know, the better branch of it is felt by women. And on a constant, our question to every other person and even to the ladies here is, how do we create the balance? And if not the balance, to, to pivot the CISO in making sure that, you know, service delivery can happen either away from the corruption or <laughs> during the in, corruption. Yeah, in the midst of corruption happening. Well, I'd I'll, I'll like to go first. And first I'd like to say, um, as a country, we need to do better. We should stop cartooning around. Mm. And what I mean by cartooning is, I'm going to borrow a leaf from Tanzania. Mm. Yeah, what should uh, uh, Yeah. Uh, Her Excellency Soloho Hassan. Mm. Postponing the celebrations of Independence Day and using that money to construct dormitories for girls, to me, that is something I applaud it's her applauding. for. Mm. For the years our presidents have been in power, we've not seen something like that. Let it be in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, or mm. Rwanda mm. being done by the men president. Mm. And a lady comes to show you how it's done. Mm. It talked about corruption and the celebration in, in Uganda. Mm. Why would we go and celebrate anti-corruption week? Spend millions, no, billions mm. of money billions. to give people fuel, government officials to travel to yes. Uganda, and whatever celebration that was. It, it does not make sense. And without even bettering the people. Either. That itself is corruption. You're going to celebrate anti-corruption mm. week. Wouldn't this money... If, if the government said for every corruption week and the budget we've used, you know, to go and celebrate, if it's going to be in Ivanda, let's get the billions, the 10 billions we're going to use, support Ivanda in maternal health, uh, in the school, mm, let's inject and construct a school, the mm. infrastructure, the roads, because farming and all that, we need a good road network. Mm. If instead of celebrating independence in Kasese or whichever district, the amounts and billions of money you're going to spend in Kasese, if then you said today it's Kasese, take the money to Kasese, that would have been a better way of fighting corruption. Because, trust me, if you look at the budgets of these celebrations, they are They're appalling. Mm. You cannot tell me a fuel of 120 million for one person. 
that can feed homesteads. Mm. That mm. can be education, uh, you know, fees for homesteads yeah. instead of you just using it as fuel. And my God, how many kilometers? How big is Uganda for the kilometers of 120 million to be used, you know, for it someone's fuel? fuel. Mm. It does not make sense. So for me, I'm relating the question to corruption and service delivery. We are wasting and cartooning around with money that could have been used to better the it's systems country. in our country. And so it's almost as though we want to do something, but we are not really doing something about it. The most hospitals we have are center three, center four. Mm. Uh, they're not even on a status of a fully fledged, you know, referral hospital. Um, if we look at a crippling medical system in a country, the effect goes to the women. If we don't have, uh, you know, enough uh, maternity supplies in mm. hospitals, it affects the women, and we see mortality rates going up, mm. and women losing their lives during childbirth. If people, uh, HIV uh, medications and uh, antiviral drugs are not being supplied to, uh, you know, mm. to victims mm. or mm. persons living with HIV, if you're not seeing schools of the, you know, visionary, vision, vision, visionary impaired people yeah. being established in every region to support persons living with disability. It does not make sense. The money can do so much. Mm. We just need to stop being selfish yeah. and greedy. And it is selfishness. Yes, and selfish and greedy mm. and thinking about your stomach and forgetting what your duty is to the people of this country. So putting up a celebration in Iba and, uh, and spending billions of money to me does not make sense. It, Financially and economically, because we're in a crisis. Even socially, it doesn't. Exactly. So we need to do better and, as and a it, country. It, it, it concerns me because we've been saying the same thing this year. Our economy is not really doing well. But we can spend billions and so, in the Thank you. And so frugality should be the norm. Yes. Is that we begin to penny pinch until things stabilize. But I am... But we now have International Human Rights Day going to be celebrated in Gulu, quite further. Where the most human rights violations are recorded. Are, are recorded. 78% of the <laughs> domestic violence cases come from Gulu, with 28% being intimate partner violence. And so when we have such a just approach of things, money being you know, spent on such an, an engagement, us in between an economic crisis, and rightly so, and then also with a budget that we can't fully fund ourselves, you know, where is the, and that is where I want you to come in, the human, the humane and human perspective when it comes to service delivery and when it comes to protection of, you know, you know these entities and services that serve women and girls in society. Um... Thank you so much. <laughs> ah, I was, I was, uh, when you talked about corruption and um, there are lots of money that were recovered and then the celebration. And I remember when the different uh, photos were paraded in the newspaper and people are still even enjoying their position and their salaries, mm. yet even the recovery, we don't know if I, what they recovered is what they took. Mm. One thing I think in Uganda to be part in um, part of those part of uh, people in ministries, you have to be a good comedian. You have to be Uganda is a theater and detached. Mm. There is a level of detachment from, from humanity. Yes, yes, you have to be when you've detached your heart from humanity. So Uganda is uh, is somehow a theater. So you need to be good at. At one point, you have to know how to. Play it that way. Um, you can't talk of service delivery when even what you're doing is hypocrisy. We have, we have normalized hypocrisy in all forms. Mm -hmm. We have normalized, uh, we have normalized accepting to settle for, no, we have normalized settling for less. Mm -hmm. The other time, there is a month, is it two months back, when one of the MPs, some northern areas, had um, donated beds, where they 10 beds in a hospital, okay. and he was all over what's up, what's up, social media, they him, he social media <laughs> showing how they had delivered 10 beds to a whole, a whole, 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 um, 
hospital in that region. It's in the north. And we have normalized settling for less. Yes, we have normalized um, accepting and um, accepting hypocrisy within us. And there is no way there will be a rightful service delivery, meaningful service delivery in such eras. Yes. How do we hold our leaders accountable? In How do we regard? hold our leaders accountable? Um, first of all, accountability starts with us before we go to the leaders. True. Seeing what we see and we keep quiet, oh, we massage, we try to talk about it and massage around it. It's already, we are, we are not being accountable. So how will I hold someone accountable? the real perpetrator or the real person who is being corrupt, the corrupt person accountable. Mm. Yet even where I'm coming from, I'm not accountable. Yeah. Corruption starts with me. Me not even doing what I'm supposed to do. Me not talking about the little things I'm seeing around. Or not even seeing a problem with it. Because or not seeing a problem. When someone, because sometimes I may not see the problem, but paying detail to someone, something, what someone is doing is, is something we need to all do. Yes, if we are to speak about humanity. Yes, I said, I, I talked about when I was starting the celebrations in Gulu. You will see convoys mm. going to Gulu. Very many people going to Gulu. They will invite, one, what we have done in our spaces. We have, we have put a fence around sp our spaces. That is also corruption. That some things have not, we don't have to talk about some things when a certain person is coming. So, so when, when we talk about something like, which drone color? Do you they will not call you again in that space <laughs> if you talk about something. Yes. So people choose to speak to what they've told them. We've settled for buying t-shirts for celebrations. Yes, we've had in this ever since, ever since, um, 25th, 25th uh, November, there have been very many celebrations and t-shirts have been bought. And But what yeah. next? In the 16 days of activism. activism. Then we've November. had the oh, Women Wednesday. Human Rights Defenders Day. We've mm. had the Human Rights Defenders Day. We've had the Human Rights Day. Our celebrations are being taken to Gulu. What next? Mm. We look at the day as itself, but what next? Yes? So we need to uh, do meaningful engagements. Mm -hmm. I call upon all stakeholders. Mm -hmm. I call upon governments. Mm -hmm. I call upon uh, civil societies. We, you have done a lot of work and I appreciate, but let's have more meaningful engagements. If we are like, um, like how she has said that they would, she prefers, like, instead of taking celebrations to a chosen, uh, uh, chosen, um, constituency. Can we look at what is lacking that constituency and do, and do, do that? We, we appreciate personally around education. I appreciate because I know education. I am um, and I, I, I advocate so much around poverty and economic empowerment. And I know with education, we can get there. And we appreciate so much of um, UPE. Uh, thank you, uh, President. You brought UPE. We have people studying in secondary. But has UPE and, yeah, and, and, and when and, and you're thinking, that is why I'm saying, but if it was really uh, good services there, if there were good services there, how many ministers, how many ministers, people in those positions, how many have Taken students there, the children there? Yeah, yes, days. there is a report, there is a research that was recently made, and uh, they, they, it shows. Um, I'll remember the report. It shows in hospitals every week, two, at least every day, two, two, two uh, health workers don't come. And uh, a percentage wow. of, uh, a big percentage of teachers don't go, but they're being paid. Yes, wow. a company, a, a, a country loses out. Mm -hmm. So service delivery, as you look at account, uh, holding, uh, holding government, holding uh, state actors accountable, let's start with holding us, people on ground, holding ourselves accountable. Yes, speaking truth to power, speaking truth to the people. Yes, we are working with, as women, let's be each one is keeper because as we look at those people up there who are supposed to bring the services down, as they are coming, how, what have we done? What have we done? People are bringing services to our grounds, to our places. Mm. Are they even, I'm in Kampala right now, 
and I'm looking at implementing something in Gulu. Yes, I will choose their one person mm -hmm. to work with who will speak on behalf of all the population in mm -hmm. Gulu. Yes, am I being real? Is really that service going to be impactful? Okay. We are... We are doing a lot of mediocre. Yeah. We are and jokers. I, and, I love, eh? and I love because, the, you know, the, the argument in this conversation is that one, we need to not just, you know, create assemblies of, we understand these things, but have civic education and civic awareness, but then also to honest, to have these honest conversations yeah. when it comes to what our human rights stake is what our individual stake is and what we can do about, you know, the realities that we find ourselves in. And I keep saying I'll never forgive Ugandans for making um, Katumba relevant, but then also for voting Katoruwama into office. <laughs> I will never forgive Ugandans for that because it was a realization that there was work missing to be done in in creating not just you know civic agency and understanding the critical what do we need when it comes to legislators and for the people that voted Kat, Katu, katumba in particular unless it was in protest mm -hmm. it still doesn't make sense to me because also that can be civil disobedience yes. to vote for you know a comic or even a person who doesn't promise anything for such a region but I'm more grateful because in having these conversations, we then start to, and I don't know if it will be helpful because I know we use com like comics as, as coping mechanisms. I have seen people laugh and create caricature out of our problems. But I'm hoping that also we can come to a place where these conversations out of a good laugh can have impact. In Even need to take out, take, issues. take, 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 take out this discussion. Most of these discussions are in-house. Yeah. Yes, yeah. we are implementing from in-house, discussing from in-house, and the real people affected. We could be, like you said, the 73% in the statistics in, in, in what? Mm -hmm. In Gulu, mm -hmm. who are affected by violence. You'll see that only, not even 5% would have been either at one time engaged. And guess what? Some of them actually think it's normal. Yes, because, because patriarchy and culture has made them believe that. Mm -hmm. And also, like, I'll still re-emphasize, as individuals, we need to have integrity. And I'm still calling the government to rethink establishment of civic education back. Mm -hmm. Because once I know my rights as a woman, and the man knows that I am supposed to be protected and have my rights protected, then we would have solved the biggest problem in this country. So we need to revamp the education system and rethink which education would build Ugandan citizens to be the better Ugandan citizens that we want with integrity yeah. and respect and love for their country. Yeah. That's all I have to say. All right. Thank you, ladies, for joining me to this conversation. I'm very glad to have hosted you. Please do come back, Queenie. Thank I you so much. I will. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we continue you know, looking out for human rights, especially in regards to women and girls. We are asking that the dignity of women and girls be, you know, protected, their freedom to expression and to any other freedoms be, you know, protected as well. But most importantly, that justice for all is, is, is kept and is realized when it comes to women and girls. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Women's Show. See you next time. Mm -hmm.